I am aware that I am standing between you and the coffee in 50 minutes' time, so I shall try and keep you awake in the meantime, and with any luck, keep myself awake as well. So, I will take questions. If we run out of time towards questions at the end, I'm quite happy to sit down and um, have questions down in this particular area. So, if you want to come up and ask me questions, then feel free. Uh, don't, don't, don't worry about it if we run out of time. And if you're watching on the video and you want to ask me a question, you can send me a tweet uh, down at the bottom, and I'll follow up at some point. I'm not going to promise instantaneous responses, uh, but I will try and uh, follow up with those things. So welcome to the talk. This is the talk on uh, understanding CPU microarchitecture for maximum performance. And what we're going to be talking about is really what happens inside a CPU, what goes on in the bits and bobs in there, how does that hook in with the rest of the system, how does the memory subsystem work, how does caching work, uh, and so on. And we're going to look at the kind of tools that we have available for being able to do analysis of how can we make our CPU run faster. So we're going to be focusing on this performance pyramid. Uh, we're going to be talking about the instructions we use, the way the memory works, the way the CPU works, uh, really at the top part of it here. So this is what this talk covers. Um, the presentations, by the way, will be available afterwards. I'll send out a tweet. They'll also be on the QCon website. Um, there are other things that you can do for performance. Uh, specifically, if you're looking at the performance of a distributed system, fix your distributed system first. Fix your system architecture first. Fix the algorithms first. Really, the top level is the last couple of percent of that particular process. So other QCon talks are available. Computers have been getting really quite complicated. Um, back when we were just talking about 6502 in the BBC, uh, Apple and uh, uh, other such systems, Commodore 64 was mine, um, you had a single processor, it just did one thing and it did it very well. These days, server processors come in multi-socket configurations. And these multiple sockets are connected to multiple memory chips and there's a communication bandwidth path between them. Um, this talk, I'm going to be focusing really on Intel specifics and on um, Linux as far as operating systems concerned. Some of them will be Linux and uh, Intel specific, but the ideas will apply to other operating systems and other platforms as well. Um, so you can have dual socket communications. In this case, you've got two sockets talking to each other. You can get four socket configurations and you can get eight socket configurations. Each one of these sockets is connected to a bunch of RAM chips that then is local to that socket, and the other RAM chips, whilst accessible, are further away and therefore slightly slower. And this is known as non-uniform memory architecture. Pretty much any serious server-side system is a non-uniform memory architecture these days. But what happens inside the chip? Well, it turns out you go down another level and you see the same sort of pattern. This is what the Broadwell chips uh, look like with a ring bus around for communicating backwards and forwards across the cores. And each one of these little squares, for those of you standing at the back, are the individual cores themselves with cache and uh, processing uh, associated with it. The 18-core die looks a little bit weird because it's got a bi-directional pump between the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So if you're going from a core down at the bottom to one over the far side, you then have an increased traffic to be able to get over there and therefore slower delay as well. And the same thing is true of the 24 core. So these sockets and these cores are really getting quite complicated. And importantly, although we think of machines as being a von Neumann architecture that you can just reference any memory and get the result back, the time it takes to get that back can vary dramatically depending on where that data is being loaded from. The current generation of Intels have moved over to a mesh-like architecture. So for things like the um, uh, Cascade and Skylake systems, they have a mesh for being able to move sideways. And this gives more paths to be able to get from one place to another, and you can theoretically do it in less time. And they come in a 10, an 18, and a 28 core variety for being able to move forwards. Each one of these chips has got bi-directional um, memory ports going out either side, and so you can actually partition these things into a kind of left and right subnuma clusters for being able to say, I want things to run on this half and talk to this bank of memory, whilst you have another set of processes that run on this side and talk uh, to that bank of memory. And in fact, there's been a recent uh, release of the Cascade 56 core. Well, actually, it's a package rather than a die, because all they've done is they've taken two of the existing dies, slapped them next to each other, and actually put in the pipeline on the same piece of um, socket that goes in. So things are getting complicated. And if we drill down further into the cores, then we see why. Because we've got different levels of cache inside each one of these processes as well. They use a dollar sign because it's a play on cache. Um, for Skylake systems, you've got a register file, which is the kind of number of in-flight uh, variables, if you like, registers that are used to hold data as it flies. And for Cascade and Skylake systems, that's uh, 180 uh, integers and 168 floating points. 
These things can usually be accessed in one clock cycle, so half a nanosecond if you're running at 2 gigahertz or slightly less if you're running a little bit faster. Those, in turn, delegate to a level one cache, which is split into an instruction and a data half. And the idea for splitting it is so that when you're processing large amounts of data, your data isn't pushing your program out of the space. And in particular, most of the time you're just reading from the instruction cache, whereas the data is a two-way street. That access time is about four um, cycles. But that then delegates back to a level two cache, which is shared between them, which is uh, typically 12, 15 cycles, something along those lines, depending on the architecture. And of course, these have different sizes. In the case of Skylakes and um, Cascade systems, it's about a megabyte at the level two cache that's specific to that particular core. But if you want to talk to external memory, there's a level three cache as well, and that's shared across all cores on the same die that you're, implement that you're loading. So there's usually a 16 megabyte uh, or something of that size that is stored on the uh, core itself, and each core can access memory from there. But of course, the time it takes to access it is really a function of how local it is to that data. Uh, one thing I want to point out, the level 3 cache on the Intel chips is non-inclusive at the L3 layer, but inclusive at the second two, level 2 layer. What that means is, if you've got some data in the L1, it will also be in the L2, but it doesn't actually have to be uh, in the L3. Um, AMD have just launched a new chip that's got an absolutely massive L3 cache inside there. Um, that has a number of performance advantages, and we'll probably see Intel coming with uh, bigger L3 caches in the future as well. But of course, these delegate out and load data from RAM. Um, in this case, DRAM, depending on how far away it is, can be anywhere from 150 to 300 cycles. It gets a little bit imprecise talking about cycles there because it's a function of both the processor cycle speed and also the memory speed as well. And in fact, if you use a program called LS Topo, it will show you how your computer looks. This was taken on my laptop. Uh, it's a single core system with a bunch of cache split over various different levels inside there. And it's actually reporting a level four cache. Now, this level four cache isn't really a cache as such. It's memory shared between the GPU and the CPU on my particular machine. That's because it happens to be a laptop. But actually, we're seeing level four cache turning up. And in particular, we're seeing non-volatile RAM coming online at some of uh, level four caches as well. And it'll be interesting to see how that evolves. Uh, the cores are shown down at the bottom. We've got a four-core processor with um, hyper-threading available. But there's more than just the memory cache. When people talk about memory caches, they usually think of this level one, level two, level three combination. But there's a bunch of others that are inside there. One of them, which is very important, is called the translation look-aside buffer, or TLB. And the TLB is used to map the physical, uh, the virtual addresses to where the physical addresses are on the system. The reason why this is important is because every time you do a process change, or potentially every time you go into the kernel and back out again, you need to update what those tables are. And so those tables will have uh, a listing, essentially, that says, if you see an address that begins with uh, 8,000, then actually map it to this particular RAM chip, which is going to be somewhere in the system. Or if you see something beginning with FFFF, then map it somewhere else. This happens for every address you look up. And so therefore, it needs to be quite fast. Specifically, if you have something in that cache, Great, you can access memory quickly. If it's not in that cache, it's going to take you a while. And that's because it has to do what's called a page table walk. Each process in your operating system has a page table. And that page table is stored in the CR3 register. But each time you do a process switch, it's changed over to something else. Essentially, this is the map that your, app, your process is running on that particular machine. And it's a tree, so I've demonstrated this as a two-level hierarchy here for being able to step between them. But actually, on modern processes, it's four levels deep. And on Ice Lake, which is Intel's next generation, it will be a five-level deep uh, page structure. And in particular, this level of page structure can give you a certain amount of memory sp space. So uh, at the moment, four-level page tables will take 47 bits, 48 bits worth of uh, space for the virtual addresses. The five levels will bring that up to 57 bits, which means you can address far more virtual memory than uh, we need. Uh, 64 terabytes should be enough for anyone. But these memory pages are split into 4K sizes. Now, this 4K size made sense back in the 386 days when virtual memory uh, came along, but it's not really great for systems that are taking hundreds of megabytes or hundreds of gigabytes worth of space. And so you can change the level of granularity that this mapping happens from a 4K size to a huge page. And a huge page basically means something that isn't a 4K size. Most Intel systems will have two different sizes for this. They'll have a uh, two megabytes and a one gigabyte support. It's under operating system control as to which one of those it uses. And each CPU will have flags to say which one it is. Different architectures have the same idea of large pages as well, but they'll work in slightly different ways or have slightly different sizes by default. <coughs> 
The purpose of using huge pages is so that the TLB doesn't need to store as many pointers. If you've just got one giant page for your process, then all of your lookups go through that one entry in the table, and you can load this fairly quickly. Um, so it's good from that point of view. It does have some downsides. It might be slightly more complex to set up and use. And if you're using huge table FS, then you need to configure it. And huge table FS is a bit of a pain. This was the first thing that came out in Linux to be able to support large pages. And what you'd have to do was to be able to specify ahead of time how many large pages you wanted and which the size was going to be. And then you had to be in a certain permission group. And then your application would then decide to use these things. And generally speaking, people tried it. People didn't like it. People stopped using it. So there was something called transparent huge pages instead. Now, this has been slightly more successful, but not without its pain points. Transparent huge pages says when you ask for a page, instead of giving back a default 4K one, then give them back a one megabyte, a two megabyte one, or a one gigabyte one, depending on how it's configured. However, most applications were written to assume that when you did an allocation of a page, you just get a 4K size back. And so they'd only write 4K's worth of data. And you've ended up allocating two megabytes worth of contiguous physical space and you're only using a small fraction of it. Uh, so transparent huge pages, when it first came out, and just giving everyone large pages by default, didn't really work. And so there are several configuration options you can do. One of them is in the huge pages enabled is to specify something that will work if you use mAdvise. And mAdvise is a call that you can say, yes, I'd like to use huge pages, please. And you can specify that in your code. If you don't do that, you get the small page. If you do, you get a big page. But one of the problems that happened for uh, high-performing systems was that you would ask for a large page, and the operating system would go, hey, I don't have a large page yet. Stand by while I go and get one. And it would then assemble a whole bunch of little pages, and it would take some time, which is not good if you have a low-latency system. So a relatively new option that was added to this, like within the last few releases of Linux, is a defer option. And what the defer option will do is it will say, OK, I'm going to ask for something. I would prefer a large page, but if you don't have one, then that's fine. I'll just take a bunch of small pages, and you can fix it again afterwards. And that has, on the whole, reduced the issue of um, the blocking that you would see. So you'll still see a bunch of blog posts and Stack Overflow answers that say, don't use huge pages. Well, give this a try with the mAdvise and with the defer and see what happens. But while the operating system deals with memory in the unit of a page size, whether that's 4K or 2 megabytes, the actual processor is dealing with memory at a cache line size. And the cache line size is, at the moment, about 64 bytes. Now, I say about 64 bytes. It's exactly 64 bytes for the Intel processors you're using on your laptops. But it may well be 128 bytes in the future. So don't assume that it's going to be 64 bytes. And particularly if you're working with mobile devices or ARM architectures, um, ARM has got something called Big Little, and you end up with processes with different size cache lines inside them. So be aware that different ones exist. For Intel servers, mostly you're looking at 64 bytes. By the time you're watching this in two or three years' time on InfoQ, uh, it'll probably be 128 bytes. You heard it here first. Um, so when you load memory from the process and iterate uh, from, from the processor and iterate through it, uh, what will happen is the CPU will notice that you're reaching out to memory and then start getting the data in. So when we're striding through a memory, processor and memory subsystem will automatically start fetching memory for you. If you can arrange your processes to iterate through uh, memory in a linear form, great, you're going to be able to go through them. Bouncing around randomly, like when you're traversing an object heap, not so good for the, object, uh, the memory system. It does notice when you're doing other striding information as well. So if you're striding through every 32 bytes or something, the memory prefetcher will notice that and just load every other line for you. There is something that you can use in compilers, built-in prefetch, which ends up being a prefetch instruction under the covers, that can request that you're going to be looking at some memory soon, so please kind of make it available. Only use this if you've got the data to show that it makes sense. You're mostly going to make the wrong decisions about it, not because you can't make the right decisions, but because you'll either request it too early and it will push out stuff that you were using, or you'll request it too late and you'll have already used the data by the time that you need it. So it's something that you can use for tweaking, but not something I'd recommend jumping to as a first point. Trying to organize your memory structure so that you can process it through linearly is going to be the way that you can improve performance at that layer. You can also have something in cache lines called full sharing. And full sharing is when you've got something of a cache line size, and you've got two threads being able to read and write inside it. Although they're writing to different locations, different variables in computer language speak, if they're reading and writing into the same cache line, then there's going to be a bit of tug of war between two cores. And if you've got those two cores on the other sides of a 56-core package or in another socket, then 
you're going to get contention inside here. And you're either going to get data loss if you haven't used synchronization primitives, or you're going to get a bit of bad performance as they're fighting over the exclusive ownership for that particular cache line. Um, so to avoid this, if you are doing uh, processing with multiple threads and you're going to be reading and writing a lot of data, then have them separated by a couple of cache lines. I say a couple of cache lines because the line field buffer, when it loads things in, will load in a couple of cache lines at a time. And so although you're not reading and writing for that section, you might find that, that you're still treading on each other's toes. And the um, uh, Sun hotspot, sorry, the Oracle hotspot compiler has a Sun mist contender, which is whacked in 128 bytes of blank space uh, when you're trying to uh, read and write something so that it avoids this particular problem. Of course, that number will change as the uh, cache line size changes as well. So in order to take the best advantage out of the memory subsystem, try and design your data layout and your data structures so that they fit in within an appropriate amount of space. In other words, if your hot data set uh, that you're processing and using a lot can fit inside the L1 cache, great, that's fine. You'll be able to process it very quickly indeed. Or you can buy an ice lake chip, which has got 48Ks worth of level one instead of 32K. Um, but if it doesn't, see if it can fit in the level two and see if it can fit into the level three. These kind of things are visible from JavaScript or Java or Python or whatever you're dealing with. And you can see if you measure performance as you ramp the sizes up that you get these step changes as you get out of one layer of cache into the next one. Um, consider how you structure your data as well. So if you've got data in a set of arrays, it may be easier to pivot and think of it as uh, a set of arrays, each with one field in. Because often if you're processing through, let's say you're processing images, you may not need to process the alpha value, but you might want to process the red, green, and blue. And if you have them as an array of reds, array of blues, an array of greens, then you'll be able to get a better performance than if you iterate through red, green, blue, red, green, blue, red, green, blue in memory. And also, consider using thread local or core local data structures as well. If you're doing some kind of map reduce operation over a whole bunch of data, treat it as a distributed system. In a map reduce job, you'd fire it out, you'd get a load of results, and then you'd merge them back in at the last step. Treat that the same with your cores as well. Get one core to calculate and do something, another core to calculate and do something else, and then bring those results in and add them up, rather than trying to fight over some sort of shared variable in memory. And consider compressing data. This happened in uh, the, the JVM recently when we had compressed strings. And instead of having each character taking up uh, two bytes worth of space, it was compressed down to only taking one byte amount of space. And that was a performance win because although it costs a little bit of extra instructions to expand and contract on demand as it's uh, loaded in, actually the fact that you're shifting less data both in and out of the caches and also for the garbage collector to process meant that it was a performance win. Um, you could use other kind of compression strategies. Uh, histogram, uh, HDR histogram is a good way of compression uh, a lot of data down in a logarithmic form. Uh, depending on your application, you'll be able to think of something as well. You can also pin where memory and threads live. So if you're dealing with a massively scalable uh, system and you've got a massively scalable problem to solve, then try and pin the threads to put certain places to be able to process them. If you're dealing with something like a, a NETI benchmark where you're consuming events over a network socket, then pin your worker thread so that one worker lives on this core, another worker lives on that core, another worker lives on a different core. And that way you'll get the best performance because you'll never get them processed or swapped around the place. If you are doing that, you might need to tell the Linux kernel to stay away from a subsection of those cores using ISIL CPUs, which is a boot time option that you can say you want the Linux kernel to do its housekeeping just on a subset of your memory. And you can also use task sets, say when you start off a program uh, like a logging daemon or something, that you want to create a CPU set that your application is going to use and other applications are going to be run elsewhere. These kind of things you can specify as a kind of Linux sysadmin to be able to do that. There's also NUMA control and libNUMA, which you can specify in order to be able to uh, control programmatically where you're going to allocate large chunks of memory. And again, you can use the subNUMA clusters or the processors to be able to decide where that goes. So we talked a lot about memory. What about the actual brains of the operation? What about the CPU? Well, the CPU, or the core, is split into two parts, the front end and the back end. And this isn't like front end development. It doesn't run JavaScript in there. Um, the front end's job is to take a bunch of instructions in x86 format, decode them, figure out what they are, and then spit out micro operations or UOPS, because U is easier to type than me on the keyboard, uh, for the back end to process. So we get a bunch of date uh, bytes that come in off the memory system. It goes into the pre-decode, which says this is where this instruction ends, this is where this instruction ends, this is where this instruction ends. Goes into an instruction decode, and then converts that into micro-ops. We're going to look at just this increment one here. 
Because when you increment something in memory, what it really means is you're going to load from memory, you're going to do an addition, and then you're going to write back to memory. And so that increment corresponds to three micro-ops. Generally speaking, you'll have a one-to-one -one type relationship between the loads and the micro-ops in the back end. If you're using complex, uh, complex addressing modes, where complex means you're adding an offset or you're multiplying some value, then there might be a few other micro-ops that get generated as well. But ultimately, the point of this is to spit out a bunch of micro-ops for the back end to do. At this point, we're all operating in order. So the instructions come in in order, the EOPs come out in order that we want them to execute as well. But there's a few things that go on the front end. Uh, one of them is the UOP cache. And so as you do the decoding from Intel instructions, which are fairly complicated, into a set of these micro operations, which are internal but slightly easier, um, they can be cached. So the next time you see it, it'll spit out the same things. And importantly, we've got a loop stream decoder which uses um, loops so that when you're running through a very tight loop, it will just serve the decoded UOPs rather than going through this parsing process. And it will shave off a few um, elements in the pipeline. Uh, most pipelines on Intel processes are between 14 and 19 uh, deep, depending on what it's doing. And one of the things that impacts it more than anything else is the branch predictor. So the branch predictor's job is to figure out where we are going next. It's kind of like the sat-nav for the CPU. Um, it's right most of the time. It probably has a better rating than me when I'm trying to do the driving navigations. Um, but it figures out where you're trying to go. It assumes whether or not the branch is taken, and then it starts serving the instructions so that by the time the pipeline flows through, the instructions are all ready and waiting to go. Sometimes that will fail. And in that case, the, the um, parsing and the decoding is thrown away. It resets to where it should be, and then you have what's called a pipeline stall or a bubble where it waits for the instructions to go through and then catch up again. If you can reduce bad speculation on the branches, you're going to get better performance in your application. Um, so the branch prediction dynamically adapts to what your code is actually doing. And this is also something that's visible from the high level as well. If you've got a Java program or a JavaScript program that's iterating through a bunch of arrays and maybe adding up, say, uh, positive numbers into one counter and negative numbers into another counter, the branch predictor figuring out which of the elements to go down is going to be confused on random data. And you'll get reasonable performance, but the branch predictor won't be able to help you because it will be right about 50% of the time. If you're dealing with a sorted data set, so in other words, you see all the negative numbers first and then all the positive numbers afterwards, the branch predictor is going to be on top of the game. And it will give you its best performance because it will assume once it's seen the first few negative numbers that they're all going to be negative until it changes over when it will revert, you get a bit of slow performance, and then the positive numbers will go on from there. Um, the branch predictor, which decides whether you go down something, is only half of the story. There's also a branch target predictor as well. And this target predictor says where it is that you're going to go to. Now, in a lot of cases, the branch predictor is going to know exactly because you're going to jump to a specific memory location. You're jumping to the uh, system exit function, or you're jumping to um, this particular routine at the start of the loop again. Sometimes, though, you're jumping to the value of, of a um, register, and that register may not have been computed yet. So it'll take a punt and think actually what it's trying to do is that it will load this data value in. Um, but sometimes that might be wrong and you need to rewind and do things again. You'll see the branch target predictor being confused a lot when you iterate through object-oriented code, whether that's C++, whether that's your own object orientation, whether it's the JVM or something. And that's because in order to figure out where to go, it has to be able to uh, load what the class is, look in the class word, and then figure out from the class word where the vtable is and then jump to the implementation in the vtable. And those few jumps are going to confuse branch predictors, um, the branch target predictor. One of the things that you can do to speed this up um, is that you can have a check to say, if this looks like an X class, jump to the X class implementation, otherwise fall back to dynamic dispatch. And that's something that you can implement very cheaply and very quickly. And in fact, the JIT and the JVM does this by using monomorphic and bimorphic dispatch for the common cases. And some of the non-Oracle ones do more than just two. Uh, but that works in C++ as well. So if you've got a dynamic dispatch call, uh, like if you're implementing a VFS. I, I saw something a while ago that said a Linux VFS operation had been sped up a factor of three or something, simply because they said, if you're using like the X2 filing system, then delegate this to the X2 implementation instead. And some of the recent uh, mitigations that have been put in the Linux kernel um, to avoid things like Spectre and Meltdown and so on have actually decreased performance of Linux over time. Uh, so by putting that kind of your own uh, monomorphic dispatch, uh, you can then gain some of that speed up back again. <coughs> 
And here, uh, I think Martin has highlighted this a few times in the past, inlining is the master optimization. Because when you do inlining, you suddenly know much more about where it is that you're going. But you also often lose an indirect call as well. And actually, losing those function calls is a good way of optimizing performance because you then don't have to worry about the branch predictor or the target predictor at the CPU from being able to do things. So we figure out where we're going. We've got a whole bunch of UOPs. We've got this nice stream of them coming through. What happens next? Well, then it goes over to the back end. And so the back end's job is to take all of these UOPs, do the calculations, and then spit out any side effects to memory. So in this particular case, we're loading from a location in memory. Uh, we're incrementing that. And then we are um, uh, writing that value back again. Now, at this point, we don't have to worry about things like EAX, um, ESI, RSI, and so on, because we've all changed them to temporary registers. The x86 ISA has these registers inside. The core has a lot more of these things. And so it says, for this particular instruction, we're going to stick uh, the temporary variable, which was EAX here, into, say, R99. Right? So we're going to pick one of the ones that's free inside this. And so as processes evolve, as this register file gets larger, we can deal with more and more in-flight data. And that's important because inside the back end, once we've done the allocation, we are now after the races. All of these UOPs are competing for availability on the kind of internal processor of the back end to actually do their work. And as soon as their data dependencies are there, they'll then be scheduled, executed, and the results will go in. Um, Intel processors and most other server-side processors these days are out of order because at this point, any of those micro-ops can happen at a time. And importantly, um, as far as the performance is concerned, this back end is capable of running multiple UOPs simultaneously. Uh, so, the front end can dispatch to the back end uh, four UOPs per cycle uh, for Intel and uh, Cascade Lake systems. For Ice Lake systems, it can issue five UOPs per cycle. And if they aren't competing for allocations, uh, for, for slots that they need to run on, then you can have you know, a number of those UOPs running in parallel as well. So in this particular case, our internal processor has got a number of ports, and those ports are the execution units. They'll all be able to do with arithmetic. They'll all be able to do logical ones. Some of them are going to be able to do divide. Some of them are going to be able to do multiply. There are different implementations for the integer and floating point sides. And all of these will be able to take up 256, byte, uh, 256 bits values inside them. Uh, port 5 will be able to handle 512 bits on its own, and you can combine ports 0 and 1 to have a 512-bit operation. So if you are dealing with 512 bits, you've essentially got two parts, either port 5 or port 0 and 1. You don't get to decide what happens. This is the CPU doing it for you. But you can at least execute those two things uh, in parallel. And there's a bunch of other ones that you need to use as well for address generation and loading and storing and so on. So in this particular case, they get allocated to their appropriate ports. We figure out what the value is that comes in from the load. We figure out that the register now is value 2A. Uh, the increment is now ready to execute because its dependency has been met. And so that does the update. And then once that's there, the write then flows out at the end. At this point, when it goes out the door, we're back to in order again. Lots of stuff can have happened. We may have made lots of mistakes. We may have knackered our cache up. Um, and we can see that externally through spectrum and meltdown. But between the UOPs going into the back end and the UOPs coming out of it, or the writes going out of it, uh, we've been in out of order through that whole time. So how do we know what's going on inside to be able to change things? Well, I'm sure you're all aware of Perf. Perf is a general Linux performance tool that can interrogate counters that are kept inside the back end uh, and the front end of the core itself. Uh, there's tools like Record, which will allow you to trace the execution of a program, annotate and report to tell you what the results actually mean from the binary file, and a stack for being able to interrogate performance counters themselves. Uh, so perf record, when you run it, will take an application, will then generate a perf data file for all of the results. You can then schlep that file off to another machine for analysis if you want to, uh, or you can do data uh, processing on the host, depending on what you're doing. When you do record recordings in Perf, it will capture the stack trace at each point. And the stack trace is then going to be where you are so you can amalgamate it and get the results back again, like profilers that you're used to at the high end will do. However, at this level, profile, the profiler is subject to what's called SCID. And SCID is you say, I want to start recording here, but actually the process is still doing things. And by the time it notices that you want to do a, um, a change, it's actually uh, got to back up and then say, well, we're here now, so I guess that's where you meant. Um, there are some precision flags, the colon p's, that you can add to it for uh, more precise values. And they will add more and more overhead, but will get you more and more closer to the precise value of what's happened. 
Generally speaking, if you're trying to identify bottlenecks in your system, then you'll be able to get a rough overview, first of all, uh, by running perf without it. And then as you hone down and narrow down where the, the issues are, you may then want to start turning up the precision to get exact values of it. When you record branches, what will happen is the perf program will try and figure out what the backtrace is by walking back the stack. If you've got code that's dealing with um, uh, the branch pointer inside there, it will be able to follow that back from the stack. But quite a lot of programs are compiled without the branch pointer support because back in the 32-bit days, we didn't have many registers, and so it was useful to be able to, uh, to use the frame pointer for something else. These days, probably less of a reason not to have it in there, but if you're dealing with um, a, debug ser a server with debug symbols, it can use the dwarf format to be able to figure out how to walk the stack back again. If you ever see things about incomplete stack traces, it's probably because you don't have the buffer pointers in there and you don't have the debug symbols to be able to track it back. However, for running code, uh, the perf command supports something called cool graph. And what the cool graph uh, option will do is say which flavor of backtracing that you want to use. LBR is Intel's last branch record. And so what happens is as the Intel processor is jumping around, it records where it's been. And if you take a snapshot of that every few uh, cool stacks, then you can build up a complete picture of where you've gone, even if you don't have the debugging symbols or the frame pointers inside there. So that will give you accurate values. Uh, there's also something on even newer Intel processors called Intel Processor Trace. And Intel Processor Trace does the same thing, but with a much lower overhead. And there's a couple of Linux Weekly articles down at the bottom, which you can find when you look at the slides later. As well as perf record, there's also perf stat. Perf stat will give you an idea of how much work your program is actually doing. And it will read the counters from the processor to be able to tell you that and tell you how many instructions there are, um, how many branches you've taken. In this case, the branch misses. We've got about 5% branch misses, so it means the branch predictor's working about 95% of the time, which is nice. Um, but that's, those are the kind of things which you could expect. One thing to look for is the instructions per cycle, or IPC. And the IPC says how efficiently you're doing work. You can have a program that's running at 100% CPU and has an IPC of 0.5 that will run dog slow, and you can have the same program running at 100% CPU and get an IPC of 2.5 and be running five times faster. So 100% times five is 100%. Right? It's a great speed up if you can find it. Um, so depending on which uh, processor you're running, the IPC is kind of going to be in a region of below one, which means that uh, we have potentially other issues that we need to investigate, or something closer to four, which is the sort of maximum type number that you'll see out of uh, these kind of systems. I think isolate, we might start to breach into the five IPC, uh, but you know, larger numbers are better in that particular case, and less than one means that you probably need to look in to find out what's going on. And these things read from what are called performance counters. Performance counters are model-specific registers that each CPU has, and as it goes through and executes instructions, it will increment this counter. Uh, you get some for free, uh, number of branches, branch misses, um, uh, number of instructions executed, and so on. But there are programmatic ones as well. If you want to count how many TLB caches you're doing, how many page walks you're doing, how many executions you're running on port 5 uh, on, the, um, pro on the processor itself, you can actually configure these counters to be able to give you answers to those values. And they've got names. Perf-list will tell you what they all are. If you don't know what the name is, but you know what the code is, you can put in something random, and that will tell you something as well. Of course, I don't know what that is. I'm, I picked it from somewhere, but I can't remember what it is. And that's because usually when you're doing analysis, you need to have a process to follow. There's something called the top-down uh, top microarchitecture analysis method, or TMAM, uh, which was created by Ahmed uh, Yassin. Um, and what it says is, let's take the performance of our application and figure out where the bottlenecks are. So in the big diagram I had before with the front and the back end, that's the kind of separation that we have. Are we failing to serve the number of UOPs from the front end? Are we blocked on the back end for doing some kind of processing? Are we retiring them? That doesn't mean going off to live somewhere in the country. That means actually doing the work. Um, or is it bad speculation because we've simply no idea where we're going? And each one of these has got various different perf counters that you can enable to be able to say where you are. Now, again, this is great if you've got it, um, and it mentions it in the Intel software optimization menu, but what it really boils down to is saying, have we ever allocated a UOP? Uh, if we have allocated a UOP, does it retire? If it retires, then great, that's useful work done. If not, uh, it falls down to the bad speculation route. And if the UOP isn't allocated, is that because we're stalling on the front end or on the back end? Now, it all sounds very complicated, but as long as you can spell top down, great, because Perf does it for you. 
If you run perf dash top down, it will run on your system wide and it will give you an overview in which buckets your system is running in. In this case, we're not timing sleep, we're just using that as a holding point for being able to uh, specify what's going on. Um, in this particular case, uh, I've got a six, uh, a six core system running on a single socket. It's probably three cores and three hyperthreads, and the retiring is somewhere between 15% and 35%. In other words, we've got between three and four times that we could optimize this to go faster. If this retiring is like 100% job done, it's beer o'clock. Um, but most of the time, you'll find this is a smaller number. And you can optimize this number by figuring out why your program's running slower and then taking steps to be able to optimize it. In this particular case, it's highlighting in red that we may be front-end or back-end bound across a whole bunch of processes. But to find out something more useful than that, this will give you a snapshot of your system, you really want to find what your process is doing. And so Andy Clean has written something called TopLev, and that TopLev tool will go through the process and give you ideas of where you can start looking. When you first run it, it downloads some configuration files from Intel's website, download.01.org, for the processor that you're running at, so that it knows what uh, performance counters it has available to it. If you're deploying this on an air gap server, you can download these configuration files ahead of time and then deploy them with it. There's documentation that shows you how to do that. Um, essentially, this is a very fancy front end to perf. So that CPU 0 theme mask equals zero, I don't know what that is, but TopLev does. And that will then be able to generate a perf command. There's an option that you can use to even say what perf command would you run so that you can then copy and paste it and run it somewhere else. Um, but this will do the work for you. Um, the other nice thing that top level will do is if you have a repeatable workload, you're repeatedly running a particular process, then you can use this in no multiplex mode. Uh, because we talked about multiplexing before, if you've got two symbols and um, you don't have a counter for them, it'll record one, then it will record the other, then it will record one, then it will record the other, and then essentially just double the count afterwards. Um, in no multiplex mode, it runs the entire program counting this counter, then it runs it again, counting the other counter. And that will give you a much more accurate view of what's happening in your system, assuming that it's repeatable. So you can then run it with dash L1. It will show you the same sort of thing as perf top down did, but for that particular process only. And here, we're creating a 16 megabyte random data file. And inside there, we're looking at a single threaded no multiplexing level one for base64 encoding this, just because base64 is something pretty much everyone has. And you can play around with this example at home afterwards. Um, and when we run it, it'll do some calculations. And one of the things that will tell us is that, by the way, did you know this program is back-end bound? In other words, we're getting the stuff in the memory. We're doing the UOP um, allocations, the branch predictions, uh, not failing dismally. We're passing it to the back-end. And then the back-end isn't going through it as quickly as we would like. If you run it with L2, it will say that it's core bound. And if you run it again, it will say it's ports utilization. What this particular thing means is that we're generating a whole bunch of instructions. They are running on one of the ports inside that diagram that I showed you several slides ago. But because there aren't any other ports available to do that, it's all being bottlenecked on this port. So for example, if we were doing a bunch of divisions, we would expect everything just to be running on port one, because that's the only one that's doing interdivision flags. Different processes will give you different performance, primarily because Intel keep adding execution units. So uh, Cascade Lake and, and um, Sky Lake are pretty much the same thing. One of them is just a slightly optimized way of laying down the silicon. Ice Lake is then adding new ports inside there and new functionality. So you'd expect this program to run faster on Ice Lake, simply because they've changed the internals of the CPU. Um, so there are, of course, different options that you can come out from there. You have to drill further to find out where the processing is happening. If it's front-end bound, then you need to look into the memory and be able to pull things out. If it's back-end bound, maybe there's something you can do with your algorithm. I'm not really proposing to jump in and fix Base64 live on stage, but my guess is that it's doing a bunch of multipliers, and those multipliers are being uh, executed on a particular port. And if we found another way of doing it, then perhaps it would be slightly faster uh, if we did it that way. One of those ways is vectorization, and I'll mention that uh, a little bit later. But one of the other things that can affect performance of your program is actually the code layout itself. So if you've got a program and you've got uh, some sort of if logic, you know, if an error has occurred, if there's a null pointer exception or whatever, um, there's two different ways of laying down that code in instructions in memory. You can either have an error test that then jumps to you know, the, go the good case afterwards and otherwise effectively just follow through into the error case in which you jump something else. Or you can do it the other way around where the normal case follows through and the bad case jumps down. As far as the branch conductor is concerned, as long as you don't error out, it's always going to guess the right branch, and it's always going to do the right thing. However, if you've got cache lines involved in this, and you've loaded the instructions in one particular cache line, 
then it's going to be, or several cache lines, uh, it's going to be good if we've already loaded the code that we want to be able to run. So if you can punch your error code so that it lives somewhere else, instead of running inside, uh, you will get better performance just because the memory subsystem is going to have less work to do. One way of doing this is to use a built-in expect function, and this is used inside the Linux kernel. They've got macros of likely and unlikely to be able to use built-in expect. But if you say built-in expect this error condition one, in other words, we expect that's the default case of doing it, the code will be laid out like that. Back in the old days, this used to emit an instruction to tell the branch processor which way to go. That hasn't been used for, well, since my hair wasn't great. Um, the, if, if you wanted to, to specify the good case, you can then specify built and expect no, and it will come and lay it out like that instead. Now, if you're using profile-guided optimization, this is the kind of thing the profile will learn for you. And if you've got a CI pipeline that's doing performance tests, gathering profile information, and then applying that, you know, this is already job done. It's doing things in this particular case. But if you aren't, this can be something that will uh, enable your good path code or hot path code to run slightly faster. The other thing, and I mentioned it a little bit before, was something called the Loopstream Decoder. And in fact, about an hour ago, I saw a tweet going past of someone saying, uh, why does this run on a particular uh, alignment? And there's a thread on Reddit that they pointed to. Um, Intel has got something called the Loopstream Detector. So when you get to the end of a loop, it'll jump back to the top and then go around the next loop. And that's basically what all loops like uh, in code. The only difference between these two loops is that it just so happens that they are in different places in memory. And that's all. Okay. If you've got a loop and it starts on a 32-byte boundary, uh, then the Intel Loopstream decoder will serve the instructions from the UOP cache that we talked about earlier. And the UOP cache can hold something like 1.5 thousand UOPs uh, along those lines. So as long as your loop isn't too big, if you're serving things straight from the UOP cache, then you will be executing that loop faster without having to do any particular work yourself. And if it's slightly al less aligned, then um, you'll go through the ordinary process, which is to read the instructions, convert them into UOPs, uh, dispatch those UOPs, and so on. And it will be a little bit slower. But over large amounts of data, or large numbers of times of processing it, uh, it can make a difference. There is a flag in LLVM that you can specify to say, OK, for the targets of where we are jumping to, align all of them to 32-byte boundaries, because, hey, you're then going to not have this problem. And the align all function says, whenever you're creating a function, make the function start on a 32-byte boundary. Uh, the uh, align all no fall through blocks is just a very complicated way of saying all of the branch directions to the start of the loop need to be on a 32-byte boundary. Uh, there was another option, which is align all blocks. And that says, you know, throw everything on a 32-byte boundary. And that's overkill, because it's only the ones where you're not worried about it when it's only the ones where you need to jump to the start of the loop where they need to be 32 byte aligned. Um, this is probably not going to help you. It may be able to help you, and it's useful to know about, but it's almost certainly not something that's going to give you for free. Um, I believe that the JIT will automatically align functions on a 32 byte boundary as well for this particular reason. Now, the important thing of mentioning uh, this as a code layout perspective is because recompiling your code can give different performance profiles. Uh, there was a blog post by Dennis um, Baklov, I pronounced your name wrong, I apologize, um, when he was talking about having a function and just by adding another function in the code, completely uncalled, but just the presence of that function affected the alignment and then saw a drop in performance. And so when you're doing performance measurement, you need to be aware that just recompiling your code can shuffle the code layout, which can give different performance profiles to do with things like this. And in that particular case, these, function, these flags are useful because then it will give you consistent performance as far as the loop screen decoder is concerned. Facebook have written a tool called Bolt, which I think stands for the Binary Optimization Layout Transformer. What it will do is it will load in your um, program code, parse it, essentially reconstitute the basic box that it started with, and then defrag them. Anyone remember defragging disks? Well, I don't know, it's maybe a last millennium thing. Um, but basically what it will do is it will uh, run your code, figure out where the uh, hotspots are. So the same kind of thing that a profile-guided optimizer will tell you as well. But figure out where those, hot, those hotspots are and then reorder all of the blocks so that all of the hotspots live in a smaller amount of memory. This doesn't change the instructions themselves. They're not running any faster. It's just saying all of the hot code, where before maybe it sat in, say, 10 pages of memory, now fits into one or two pages of memory. And therefore, you get much better utilization of the cache uh, and the pages that are brought in. Uh, there's an ArcSiv paper 
How do you pronounce Arxiv? I've never figured that out. Um, th there's a paper that they published, and there's a repository on the bottom of there, which you can follow from the slides. Um, another thing that I mentioned is the parser, uh, SIMD parser for um, uh, processing uh, vectorization. Um, and this is something that Daniel Lemire has written, uh, and a few other people as well, um, being able to do a vectorized processing of SIMD instructions, in other words, vectorized instructions for parsing JSON files. So typically when you parse JSON, it ends up being in a switch loop. Is this character an open brace? If it is, then go down uh, this particular path because we're doing an object. If it's quote, we're doing a string and so on. Um, it turns out that if instead of reading things a byte at a time, you read 64 bytes at a time, then you can get much better throughput for being able to parse your JSON object and generating the object uh, as a result. And so he and a few others worked on this approach for generating uh, instructions, uh, generating uh, the, the, the uh, JSON parser, and compared it with the kind of known existing best ones in the open source. And they saw a speed up of around two to three times, depending on which benchmark it was that they were using. There's a couple of reasons why it's faster. One is that instead of processing one character at a time, we're processing four characters at a time. And the second thing is that they've got a, um, they've got a uh, mechanism for avoiding branches. And so one of the things that vector operations will give you is a way of um, doing masking operations and then being able to combine things together. Because as we talked about previously, the branch predictor's job, guessing whether you went down a branch or not is made significantly easier when there isn't a branch to go down. Uh, and so this particular case um, was branch free and therefore was uh, a lot faster for going processing. So we've talked about a lot of different ways that uh, we can do analysis of programs and some of the techniques and some of the ideas that you can use to get programs faster. Uh, if you're dealing with memory, you want to try and use cache aligned memory or cache aware data structures so that um, things are based on 64-byte chunks because that's realistically what's happening under the covers, or page size chunks. Um, data structures like B-trees, which have historically been used a lot in databases and on disk formats, are something which work relatively well for the way memory is laid out, uh, and so you can consider that too. Compress data to make sure that you can compress and decompress data on the fly inside the processor because the cost of schlepping the memory around is usually where the performance problems lie. And if you can, avoid random memory access. Random memory access is the thing that will kill memory lookup performance at runtime. Have a look at whether huge pages can help. Uh, certainly, you can get 10 or 15% speed up on some types of applications simply by enabling huge pages. Databases tend to be very sensitive to this, and you should follow those instructions to say whether or not this is a good thing uh, or a bad thing. And um, can, configure how you source your memory by looking at the lib numa and uh, the other controls that allow you to specify where your processes run. Because the more local you can get your data to the program, the better it's going to be. As far as the CPU is concerned, each CPU is its own network data center. So in the same way that you've been thinking about distributed processing systems, being able to move data and summarize them uh, across multiple network machines, think of that as what's happening inside your server as well. If you can get it so that your data is closer, uh, then it will be uh, processed much faster than if the data has to come from somewhere else. And in particular, the branch speculation and memory cache misses are pretty costly. Um, earlier on, uh, there was something, someone who mentioned that um, when you're thinking of complexity of programs, don't think of it as the number of instructions that you run, but how long you can run without a cache miss, and really count complexity of algorithms in the number of cache misses that you hit. Uh, look at branch-free and uh, lock-free algorithms. We didn't really talk about lock-free because when you have locks, you generally don't have something that's CPU intensive because it's blocked waiting on something else. But if you can use uh, lock-free and uh, branch-free programs, then you're going to get better performance out of it because you're not going to be contending and the branch predictor is not going to get in your way. And then use perf counters with the help of perf, uh, sorry, performance counters, I should say, with the help of perf or top lev to be able to indicate exactly where your program's slowing down. Is it the pulling in memory? Is it the cache misses that we're seeing? Uh, is it the fact that we're waiting for this particular dispatch port? And use vectorization where you can. Uh, most compilers will give you auto vectorization for free uh, with things like loop unrolling to be able to 
give you the best possible performance, but it may be the case that dropping out into your own vectorized code or vectorized assembly makes sense for particular types of operations. And things like uh, the JVM will use uh, vector code for doing uh, object array copy, for example, when it knows it can just copy whole swathes of data with vector instructions instead of as a byte-by-byte -byte loop. Now, I've compiled all of the references that I used into the presentation on this slide, so if you don't want to download the slide and be able to use it, then you can take a photo of this and you'll be able to find it from there. And I've also created a section of links to other people's blogs and other items that you might be able to use as well, including some of the ones that I've mentioned within this presentation. And so those are good things for following up. And with that, I will say thank you. Um, my links to presentations are down here at the bottom. Uh, that's my blog on the top and my Twitter feed where I shall uh, post a link to the slide. Uh, if you're impatient, you can go to Speaker Deck now. I've already published it and I'll send out the link as soon as I finish speaking. And there's some other links to things like uh, my GitHub repo and other narrated videos that I have done in the past. And with that, thank you very much. <laughs>